Whether the focus of your TA-ship is on facilitating group discussions, teaching seminars and tutorials, or guiding laboratory sessions, having a lesson plan can be helpful both for your own teaching as well as helping to guide student learning. Hi, my name is Carolyn McRae and I'm an Educational Development Fellow at the Centre for Teaching and Learning at Queen's. Throughout this video, we'll discuss what are the benefits of having a lesson plan, some of the key elements to include within your plan, as well as finishing off the video with two different models that you might try when drafting your first lesson plan. It's important to note that these models might not be what works for you, but are a starting point to help give you some ideas of what you might include in your first lesson plan. Let's get started. So as we start to think about lesson planning, one of the questions we have to start by asking is why use a lesson plan? Think about your new role or your current role as a TA and how lesson planning might be important to use for you and how it might benefit you in this new role. When I think about my use of a lesson plan, I think about it in the same way I use a recipe when I'm cooking. Having a recipe provides me with a list of ingredients, a series of steps to follow, often with timing associated with each step, a list of resources that I might need, as well as some tips to help make the recipe a success. Using a lesson plan provides me with the same structured outline. Often I'll have a reminder of what resources, readings, or tools I need for that particular session. And for me, this might be a list of what I need to bring to the session, but it might also be a list of what I've asked students to do to prepare for this particular session. I'll also include an outline of student expectations and deliverables. Is there something that I expect students to be able to do or to hand in by the end of this lesson? For time management, I think of having a lesson plan as being your outline of how much time you want to spend on group discussions, activities, and for students to work independently. Importantly, your lesson plan can act as a written or reflective record. I encourage you to think about taking notes throughout your session, seminar, or tutorial about what elements are going particularly well and which elements you would like to improve upon. After your lesson, reflect upon what's happened and write down some notes on what you would do the next time if you were to teach the same lesson again. Something to consider is the time management. Did the activities that you plan match with the time that you allocated to each activity? Knowing that an assignment that you originally planned 20 minutes for took 40 minutes to complete in class is important to know for the next time you're lesson planning and want to use that activity. Lastly, in your lesson plan, you might articulate the alignment between the course or session learning outcomes and assessments that students might have coming up. This is important when you're planning your lesson to think about how the activities and discussions that you're building into a seminar or tutorial and how they align with how students will be assessed in the course and what they'll be assessed on. So this is what goes into a lesson plan, but what would that lesson plan look like? A typical lesson plan will include logistic information about the course, date and time, location, and the instructor. You'll also likely find learning outcomes specific to that particular lesson, along with a description of the content or discussion topics for that week. Your lesson plan might include some detailed activities that you're planning, as well as the time allotment for each of these activities. You might think to include any assessments either assessments that are taking place during this session, like a quiz or a test, or reminding students of upcoming assessment that this content will be related to. Often my lesson plans also include materials and resources that are needed for this particular session, as well as lists of what both I as the instructor or TA and students might need to complete before and after this particular class. Lastly, as we just spoke about, Having a section on your lesson plan to be reflective and to jot notes down will be important if you are to teach this course or the same lesson again. Lesson planning for the first time can be a daunting task. I often hear questions about what content do I include? What type of activities can I build into a lesson? How do I keep students active, engaged, and excited about course material? Getting started on lesson planning can be easier if you have a model to start with. Each of the models is different, but finding a model that works for you is what's most important. In this video, we'll start by describing two different models that you can take a look at and modify for your own lesson planning. The first model is called Set Body Closure, and the second model that we'll see is called BOPS, 
or BOPPPS model. In this first model, the lesson is split into three distinct sections called the set, body, and closure. In the first part of the lesson, the set, you're establishing the mood and motivating students. Here you'll want to find something to catch students' attention. It might be describing how this information will be useful to them, how it relates to other course content, or how it relates to something in the news or in their daily lives. Within this set section, you'll want to also understand what students already know about the course content and how what they're going to learn in the new content relates to their prior knowledge. In the body section of your lesson, here is where you'll introduce new content and the skills that students are going to practice and master during this session. A few ways to introduce content are called big picture, details, big picture. In this way, you start by taking the content and introducing the big picture idea of what this topic is. You then slowly narrow down and become more and more focused on the smaller elements or details of the content. Then you finish off by coming back to the big picture and explaining how it all relates together. Another way of dividing the content is by helping students understand the need to know concepts versus the nice to know concepts. This can be helpful for students because these need to know concepts are the really crucial pieces of information and often the content that they will be assessed on. Finally, this last section is the closure. And this is where you'll summarize all of the content that you introduced during the body section. And you'll relate it back to the set. Here you want to ensure that you are not introducing new information. This is a space where you can also talk about how this content relates to previous lessons and how it might relate to lessons that are upcoming. Alternatively, if we look at the BOPS model, BOPS divides the lesson into six different sections. Although you'll notice some similarities in how the sections are laid out, these sections in the BOPS model are a little bit more detailed than what we saw in the set body closure. First, the B in BOPS stands for bridge in. This is where you'll grab students' attention, and maybe it's a story, a poem, a puzzle, or a case scenario. Something to link the content from today's lesson to make it engaging. The O stands for learning outcomes, where you'll be transparent about what students are aiming to learn during this lesson and what you hope that they'll achieve. The first P in BOPS stands for pre-assessment. Understanding what students already know about the content will be helpful to guide the activities that you have planned, as well as using that understanding to build upon their prior knowledge. The second P in BOPS stands for participatory learning. Here is where you'll mostly introduce new material. You'll have activities or active learning and opportunities for students to engage with the material and to practice their learning through activities. In the participatory learning section is where you also might find independent writing activities or group work. The third P stands for post-assessment. This is the section of the lesson where you'll have to gauge if students have understood the lesson and the material that you've introduced. This might be in the way of the short quiz, a writing activity, or having students fill out a bit of a feedback form. And lastly, the S in BOP stands for summary. Again, the summary section is not a place to introduce new content, but to summarize what you've done during the lesson and to tie back to that original bridge in. What's most important here is to find a lesson plan model that works for you. Lesson plans are typically one to two pages in length. However, which elements you choose and how you structure your lesson plan is entirely up to you. My suggestion is to try a few models and see what works for you, and you might adapt one or more of these models into something that works for your style of teaching. In summary, lesson planning can be helpful to organize thoughts, plan out some discussion questions and activities, and how long you might work on each of these activities within the lesson. For those who are new to TAing or guest lecturing, using a template or a model for your lesson planning can be helpful as you're developing your teaching practice. The more you teach and the more lesson plans you create, the more you will figure out how you like to lesson plan the best and what works for you. Lastly, including opportunities for reflection in your lesson plan is important not only so that you can improve your lesson plans from year to year, but also for your own professional development and understanding what elements of the teaching work best for you and where your strengths are. If you have questions about lesson planning 
or would like some help in developing your first lesson plan, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at the Center for Teaching and Learning at ctl.queensu.ca. At